Amen. What a wonderful uh, Trinity Sunday anthem. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, this morning uh, we are continuing our series on the church's mission statement that we've been uh, working through the last few weeks. And uh, this week we are going to be in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 42 to 44. This is just a short little section between two other things. So, uh, but, it, but it's uh, loaded with meaning for us this morning. Hear the word of God. At daybreak, he, that's Jesus, departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowds were looking for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Letting go is hard. Uh, My mom is moving into a retirement community this week, and as some of you may know, that means giving up a little bit of space and maybe giving up some possessions, and that is not always easy. Maybe some of you vividly remember that first morning where you took your son or daughter to kindergarten or you drove your kids later on in life to college, right? You have trusting someone else with their care or maybe stepping back from a part of their lives in a, in a healthy way, and uh, that, uh, that can be tough to do. Uh, I have a friend who was diagnosed recently with this uh, syndrome that gives him these mild seizures from time to time, and it's not really serious for him, but it did mean that he had to give up his driver's license. And so his wife has to drive him around, and that is super tough for him to do. You might have heard that uh, the Watts family, maybe you read it in the newsletter or something, but that uh, the Watts family has just purchased a house that's only two blocks from the church. And uh, we're really excited to be so close to the church, but we're even more excited to uh, come and be part of the South Hill community with some of you. Uh, So we're really looking forward to that. The only downside is the sellers aren't leaving until July, so we have to wait all that time, and we'd love to be here uh, even sooner. Uh, And yet, given all of that, we have moments, right, because we've been in our house for several years, and we've raised our kids there for many years, and it's in a beautiful setting. And so we have these times when we look around, and it's just hard to say goodbye, right? It's hard to move on. I'm sure some of you have experienced that as well. So... When we look at the people in the text, it's, it's kind of easy to understand where they're coming from, right? When something or someone valuable comes into our lives, we don't want to let that go. We want to protect it. We want to hang on. And so the crowd comes in this text, and, and we kind of understand where they're coming from. Jesus has just performed some wonderful miracles. Many healings and exorcisms have taken place, and the word has spread that Jesus is doing amazing things, changing people, transforming lives. It's been a day of impressive deeds, and so these people seek him out, and they don't want to let him go. They want to hang on. Jesus is praying And we know that because Mark's version of this event tells us that. And Jesus maybe is resting in this quiet place when this crowd of people come to find him. Now, the crowd's behavior is expected, right? I mean, after all, Jesus is doing these such great things and everybody wants a piece of what is happening. And so all of these people who know Jesus and they know about him reach him and they try to prevent him from leaving. They want him for themselves. And I would imagine that it would, they would take whatever steps they possibly could to prevent him from leaving. They want to hang on. They don't want to let him go. Now, they don't care what Jesus needs to do as long as they get to be with him or get some of what he has to offer. But obviously, Jesus has a different plan. When the people ask him to stay with them, We assume they asked, but maybe they uh, demanded for, for all we know. What's his response? 
Well, he simply says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also. For I was sent for this purpose, or that's why I was sent. And immediately after that, he continues to preach the message and he calls the first disciples to help him spread the news. Jesus is focused on others. He is outwardly focused. Our church's mission statement ends with the word serve. That's what Jesus is about. The crowd knows Jesus. They've already heard his message. And so now Jesus moves on. Jesus is thinking of serving other people. He is thinking of the outside. Now we could say a lot about service this morning, but at the heart of service is simply thinking of others being concerned not with our own needs or the needs of Hamlin Church, but the needs of those around us. This is one of our reasons for being a church. Our mission and our mission statement is for other people. That is service, and it requires doing what the people in the text could not do. We let Jesus go. We don't give up on Jesus, but we let him go. We serve by sharing Jesus. All of us can do that, but how do we do that? How do we let Jesus go? How do we make sure that what Hamlin Church does serves, that our mission as a church is about other people and not just about us? How do we serve others when we might be tempted to just keep Jesus for ourselves? Well, let's look at the text. First thing that Jesus does is he goes and he finds a deserted place. In the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus does that, it's always to be in a place of waiting and preparation for the next stage of ministry. Jesus is in touch with the Father at every step, and he does that by spending time with God in quiet preparation, considering his next step. He quietly prepares to serve others. Instead of wasting time making crowds of people feel good, he prepares for more people to hear his message. This preparation is key. Now, we all prepare for many things in in a lot of ways, right? I mean, there are very few things in our lives that we can do without some level of preparation. Can't even meet a friend for lunch without making an appointment first and setting that up. Can't clean our house or clean out the garage without maybe buying some cleaners or getting a broom or something like that. Can't drive a car without making sure there's gas in it. When I go backpacking, There's lots of preparation. I'll bet some of you know about all of this. In backpacking, you've got to have all kinds of equipment, and you've got to know how to use that equipment. You have to know how to prime the little stove and read the map and read the compass and so on. It's taken me a long time to gather all the equipment that I need for backpacking trips, but many years ago, Kathy and I did not have all the equipment that we have now, And so when we went backpacking, things were harder. But now we're more prepared. We have better sleeping bags. We have a better stove. And best of all, we have a bear-resistant canister, which is really great because you don't have to worry about your food while you're you're on, uh, you know, when you're, you're backpacking. So we are more successful backpackers now because we are more prepared to serve others with the message of Jesus Christ. We want to be prepared. We want to pause as individuals and as a church to to pray through exactly how we will join Jesus in his mission, how we will let Jesus go. We prepare to make sure that we are not keeping him just to ourselves. Now, I think you all did a lot of that preparation during the interim period certainly did some of that preparation when you were creating this mission statement. Preparation is important. That's what Jesus does. But of course, we have to leave the preparation eventually. Kathy and I are grieving the fact that now we have all this cool equipment, uh, but we can't really go backpacking anymore. 
We finally have everything I think that you'd pretty much want to have that, that you'd ever want to go backpacking with, uh, but we're just too busy now. So all of our equipment basically just sits in the basement. The people in the text, the crowd that approaches Jesus would love nothing more than to just stay with the preparation. They want to keep Jesus in their basement. They're content to be wowed by Jesus and and maybe sort of take what he has to offer and then stay with him in that place. They don't want to let him leave. They won't let him go. But Jesus jars them out of this desire by simply letting them know that he is not just for them. They want to possess Jesus, but he cannot be controlled or owned. Nothing can contain him, not false definitions of who he is, not selfish expectations of what others might want from him, not a desire to please others, not a temptation to be comfortable around people who love him. Nothing can hold him back. Therefore, he curtly informs the crowd that it's time for him to serve. And then he leaves. The crowd was either really disappointed by this or maybe they joined him in his service. And with the first disciples began learning and sharing Jesus Christ with others. And so even though this phrase, let Jesus go, that I've been using, probably doesn't sound like a lot of the uh, popular phrases that we're used to hearing when we're talking about Christian things, the truth of the text is that Jesus is not just for us. Now, of course, he is for us in the sense that we have a relationship with him and he is our Lord and Savior. Jesus it has come to save us. We continue to be fed by him, but he is not ours to possess. He is not ours to keep to ourselves. Jesus is not only for us. He is also for others. So if we want to serve, we affirm that we cannot possess Jesus. Fritz Kreisler was a world-famous violinist. He earned a fortune with his music and his concerts, uh, but he actually gave most of it away to other people. So once when he was traveling, uh, he came across an exquisite violin and he wanted to purchase it, but he didn't have the money. So he went away and raised the money and then he came back to the seller of this violin and he was deeply disappointed because he discovered that the violin had already been sold to a collector. So he went to the collector's home and he offered to buy the violin from him. But the collector said that the violin had become his prized possession. It was the most beautiful object he owned. He kept it in a glass case and looked at it every day, and it was so beautiful that he wouldn't sell it. Chrysler was so disappointed. But before he left, he had an idea. Could I play the instrument once more, he asked, before it is consigned to silence. The collector agreed, and Chrysler proceeded to fill the room with the most beautiful and heart-moving music. The collector's emotions were were deeply stirred. He said, I have no right to keep that to myself. It's yours. Take it into the world and let people hear it. We cannot possess the gospel and keep it locked away under glass. We don't just collect the good feelings we gain on a Sunday morning. We give Jesus away because we know he is not just ours to keep. The crowd from our text is making their relationship with Jesus a private, maybe even selfish thing. Instead of serving, they just want to possess Jesus. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we want that too, right? We can be tempted to just keep Jesus to ourselves especially for those of us like me who were raised in churches that tried to keep everything just right. Now, maybe your church wasn't like this or maybe you weren't raised in a church, but I remember not being able to take my cookie 
into the fireside room during coffee hour. And I remember being dressed in clothes that I would never wear anywhere else. I remember my family complaining if the worship music wasn't right. I shared a little bit about that with you last week. And I remember them complaining and other people complaining too if the sanctuary was too hot, which it always was in the California Central Valley. Once my grandfather, who was really a very godly man, complained that the wind had slammed the sanctuary door shut so loud that it woke him up during the sermon. (laughs) Growing up, I remember thinking that the church and church services were just for us, that they were all about me. I thought that the church was there just to take care of people and to keep people happy. And I remember thinking how nice that was. And I have to admit that I still catch myself thinking that from time to time. But that way of doing church is the best way to keep Jesus a secret. It comforts everyone, but it doesn't serve anyone who hasn't heard. In the words of Luke, it prevents Jesus from leaving. But our mission statement ends with the word serve. And if we want to serve, to join Jesus in going out, not only do we prepare, not only do we affirm that Jesus is not just for us, but we also center our whole lives around the very thing that drives Jesus himself. Mission. If we want to let Jesus go to the other cities also, we want to be motivated by mission. And that is how we can really serve. Our mission statement isn't just something that we put on the cover of the bulletin, which it actually is today on the cover of the bulletin. Our mission is why we are a church at all. Every time we do anything as a church, we could ask, does it meet our mission? If it doesn't, then we should move on to something else that does. That's exactly what Jesus does in the text. He sticks to mission to serve others. A news article from uh, 1985 was about the celebration of a big city municipal community pool. It was a big party gathered around this pool and it was held to celebrate the first summer in the city's history where there was not a drowning at the city pool. And so 200 people had gathered to celebrate this event, including 100 certified lifeguards. As the party was breaking up, the four lifeguards on duty began to clear the pool. And as they did that, they found a fully dressed body in the deep end. They tried to revive 31-year-old Jerome Moody, but it was too late. He had drowned, surrounded by lifeguards, celebrating their successful season. The lifeguards had forgotten their mission as they celebrated. And as a result, a person drowned. Jesus said, for this purpose, for this mission, I was sent. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. When we are focused on internal concerns or when we are just content or maybe we're just happy with the way the church is, we might forget our mission. That's why we take steps to remind one another to serve others, to be outwardly focused so that we can share Jesus and include others in our church. What we do as a church And how we live our lives as people is done with this mission in mind. We must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also. Because with Jesus, we are sent on that mission. We prepare. We affirm that we must let Jesus go. And we focus on the mission that we've been called to. That is the heart of service. Our mission statement is a call to serve others. The mission statement is not there to make us a good church. It is there for other people. So if we're serious about this mission statement, and I know that we are, then we are called to serve. Let us pray. Holy God, 
you call us to serve others, to be outwardly focused and to love others in a way that enables us to share you with them. And so we pray that you would empower us to do so. In your name we pray.